Hello, uh, thank you all for joining us. This is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, and today we have Chris Ott, our deputy director, joining us to man the questions um, and chats. So um, we learned how to make the questions public this time. So please use the question box if you want to ask a question. If you don't want to be named accidentally, uh, put your question in as anonymous and we won't use your name. But uh, thank you again for joining us. We've got ex uh, an exciting step has been taken. There's a lot more to be done. We wanna go over that today um, and have an opportunity for all of you to ask your questions. Um, a little bit of background, or let me get back to the presentation. Um, so the High Speed Rail Alliance is a nonprofit uh, we're supported by donations from our members, uh, primarily individuals, but also corporations, municipalities, and foundations support our work. Um, together, we're a group of people that really wants the ability to travel by train or have the benefits that occur um, when folks have the ability to come and visit your city by train. Um, we believe that that will lead to additional freedom because you can travel more often, uh, additional opportunity to either go to college or work in different places. And uh, because it'll reduce the overall cost of doing government and make people happier and build better connections, it's a better way for building prosperity. Um, we were founded at the uh, launch of high-speed rail between Madrid and Seville. Um, and have continued to be frustrated that Spain has high-speed rail running at uh, now 205 miles an hour maximum, but uh, this was on a 20th, 25th anniversary celebration train of Madrid's trains between Madrid and Seville that I was on several years ago. And it points out one of the key features of trains is not only does it make travel safer, more convenient, less stressful, but also you can actually talk to each other face-to-face -face while the train is in motion. You can use your iPad or your laptop whenever you want. Uh, so it really makes it possible for us to create much stronger connections uh, between communities and across regions. Um, we believe that we need to have interconnected networks across broad regions that combine shared use lines where frequent passenger trains are operating with heavy long freight trains. Uh, with the right infrastructure, you can do that well, uh, but the speeds are limited to 90 miles an hour. Uh, regional lines where governments take existing lines um, and upgrade them for frequent light, uh, frequent fast passenger trains like on uh, the Northeast Corridor where Acela operates. Um, and new high-speed lines where the trains are going 200 miles an hour or above. Um, and that's what really brings the juice to the system. So if we could build 120, 150 miles in each direction out of Chicago and, and have a lot of things feeding into that, it would really change the game for the entire Midwest. Uh, but it takes big picture planning. It takes long-term commitment. And it takes really a strong role of the federal government. And we're very excited because Congress has made a big step in that direction in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's a big step. It's not where we want to go, but we should be really excited about the steps we, we have taken. So now that Congress has passed the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, this is where the really fun work starts. Uh, so we'll outline today what has happened so far and what needs to happen to take full advantage of it. And in short, what we really need to do is help persuade states all across the country to get really aggressive about applying for the money that's available and then ensuring the projects get done in a very timely way. Um, we need to have Congress appropriate money every year. So this is not just a one-time slug. Uh, they're gonna talk about how to spend money again next year, 
And we really need to help have states and local leaders persuading Congress to appropriate to get money again next year. And then this gives us an opportunity to set the stage for an even bigger program, getting much closer to what we want um, each cycle of the reauthorization process. To explain how all of this works, um, um, I want to uh, borrow um, a fishing analogy that um, was taught to me as part of a class on how to be a strong bicycle advocate in the early 90s. So to explain the complicated process you have to go to get from people talking about a, a federally funded project to actually being able to use that project, um, uh, someone came up with this really good of analogy of fishing. So imagine there's a county and that county has a couple, three lakes um, and they want people to be able to, to eat fish out of those lakes, but um, the lakes aren't big enough to, to have enough fish on their own. Um, so they have to stock the lake, people have to go out and fish, they have to clean and cook the fish and then put it on the table. And then that's when you get to eat. But the process starts long before that fish is on the table. So we've completed at the federal level, three critical steps. The first is we've had the debate should we put fish into these lakes? Um, and that's the debate over the bill at the congressional level. Um, and so that process ended on one of the bills that we care about, the Jobs Act. Um, and the debate is still occurring um, on the reconciliation bill, the Build Back Better bill, which actually passed the House today and will move to the Senate. So that's the first stage. Typically at the federal level, there are two more stages. There's an authorization and there's an appropriation. Um, and typically they are two separate bills and two separate laws. So part of the confusion or part of the, or getting into a real understanding of what just happened, you need to understand that there's these two separate pieces and they accomplish two separate things, but they were mixed together into one. So getting a little bit down into the weeds a little bit more on these two pieces, um, the authorization bill asked the question or answered the question, should we put fish into the lakes? They said, yes. Um, so it says, which lakes? What kind of fish are we gonna put in those lakes? Who can go get a license? Um, and roughly, not specifically, roughly how much should we spend? Um, so at this point, it's just policy, it's not actual spending. And the appropriation then says, yeah, we're actually putting fish into the lake. So the questions that they answer are specifically, how much are we going to spend? Where is that money going to come from? Um, and how long do people have to spend it? Um, uh, or actually in this case, if we're gonna continue the analogy, for how long can people go actually get that license and go out and fish for that? Um, so this is where we are in this process. We've got to the point where there are now fish in the lake. But first let's talk about some really key policy changes that happen. Um, one of our long-term goals is that there's a national integrated plan. Uh, so again, mixing high-speed lines with regional lines and shared use lines to create uh, good high quality passenger service across the entire country. Um, not everybody gets the same level of service, of course, uh, but you should be able to travel throughout the country by train and by connecting bus. Um, so another big step in this direction is that in the next six months, uh, the Federal Railroad Administration has to deliver a corridor plan to uh, the uh, to Congress in order to describe how they are going to prioritize the use of these funds. Uh, so that's another big step towards creating a national plan. And hopefully that's, we can move closer towards a lot more pink and yellow of real progress um, on this map um, across the country instead of just in isolated areas. 
So that's a huge first step. Another big step is that they have refined Amtrak's mission. So Amtrak was created with the myth back in 1971 that it could be a for-profit business. Um, and each authorization cycle, we've gotten further and further away from that. And this is a much bigger step in that direction. And to me, it's symbolized in one line of the law where they basically do a find and replace on an entire section of the law. So they change business to service um, with just a big find and a replace. And that symbolizes you know, a big step in the direction of pointing out that Amtrak is a federally owned corporation and its purpose is to provide service to the country, not to provide returns to stockholders. Um, so that's a huge step in the right direction. Um, they also have refined the relationship between the states and commissions um, and Amtrak, um, partially by funding through the Amtrak appropriation, uh, the operations of multi-state compacts like here in the Midwest, uh, the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, um, and a new commission that's been created to uh, uh, serve the area around the Atlanta hub, um, an existing commission that uh, kind of is the hub around New Orleans, et cetera. Um, and then it deals with some of the accounting issues. So because railroading is such a capital intensive business, it's actually hard, very, very difficult to actually figure out what everything costs. And there's a lot of discussion at the state um, and Amtrak level about what costs should be. Uh, so we're taking another big step in the direction to getting um, a solution that people are happy with. So again, you know, if we're continuing to use the fishing analogy, um, the federal government isn't a fishing boat where you can make changes quickly in, in direction. We're more like an aircraft carrier where you have to take changes slowly. And these are pretty big changes for an aircraft carrier that we've made. But again, we want to set the stage for five years ago, five years from now, we're making even bigger steps in the right direction. Um, and in my view, another big step is that Congress has made it clear that they want the long distance trains to expand. Um, in this initial um, uh, round, um, they specifically stated that a specific amount of money is to go to long distance trains. And again, setting that stage for the next round, um, they've directed the Federal Railroad Administration to do a study that would uh, uh, put together a proposal for Congress on how to actually expand the network in the future. And uh, part of that that I find very exciting is the FRA has the authority to study any route that was in place in April of 1971. Um, and that's important because um, we basically burned the village to save it on May 1st of 1971, where we had a great uh, pairing back of the network. So the network was a lot bigger in April of 71, and we're excited that the FRA has the authority to look at anything in that much bigger network um, that existed at that time. So this is a huge step in the right direction, especially for those who aren't in the Northeast Corridor or in California, uh, because these really are the foundation for building not only the network um, step by step, uh, but also for building a political coalition that's national uh, that can uh, sustain uh, changes in leadership in Congress and in gubernatorial offices um, over time. So this is, again, an exciting big step in the right direction. So getting more into the nitty gritty, and um, there are lots of lakes if in this fish analysis, there are lots of lakes that you can use to improve inner city passenger rail service. And I wanna point out 
that the highway departments of the states don't want you to know that there are ways of using uh, their uh, highway allocations from the federal government to expand passenger rail, but it's true. Uh, but there are, there, are, there are other ways as well, but these are the core uh, pots of money at this point. Um, so, and then this gets into the difference between the appropriation and the authorization. So the first step is to create a multi-year authorization. And this bill did that. So it's a dramatic increase to um, Amtrak's, what they've been getting. So they've basically been getting uh, $2 billion a year, a little bit more. This gives them the opportunity to get a little bit more than $3 billion a year. But again, it's an opportunity. Congress needs to um, appropriate that money every year. So again, Right now, we've got to start the process of persuading Amtrak, uh, Congress to appropriate this money at the end of next year. Um, and I put an asterisk there because those monies are different every year and that's a rough average of what that authorization is per year. Uh, the state of good repair program that gets a big plus up in its authorization. Uh, the Chrissy program as well. There's a new program called the Great Cross and Elimination Program uh, that again is super important. And then um, in the reconciliation bill or the Build Back Better bill, at this point, there is funding for, for high speed rail, uh, but it's not in this bill. Uh, so we're not quite there yet. Um, but there's different ways of using this funding. Um, and uh, depending upon the program, um, and I didn't put that in uh, for the Great Crossing Elimination Program because clearly there's only one thing that can be used for. Uh, but this is going to be challenging because there are so many pots of money to figure out how to allocate these funds between projects so that this, the project applications line up in a way that makes sense and you can figure out how to piece them together. So that's one of the processes that there needs to be a much more robust thought process going on to make this work. Um, and then of course, Amtrak is the only entity that can spend the Amtrak money. I wanna point out that the State of Good Repair Program now is actually can be used for expansion and they've added private intercity passenger railroads as entities that can use those funds. In addition, they actually added that to Chrissy as well. So again, that's a huge, huge step forward. Um, and then we hope to see true high-speed rail money um, coming down the pike. Um, so that's not the end of it. Um, this is an exciting opportunity. And we need to make sure that this opportunity is actually seized by the parties that can make this happen. So if you really wanted to get into it, there's more steps than this, but to really refine what needs to happen from here, um, people need to go out and actually put their hooks in the lake in order to apply for these projects. And there's an application project process uh, that will be launched in probably about 180 days. So right now, the entities who are capable of applying for this money need to apply, get their applications in order. And so um, um, I wanna point out in this analogy, we are the friends who want to eat the fish. The only role we have, uh, it's an important role and it's a, a critically important role, but the role we have is to persuade mom and dad to actually go out and fish. Um, but um, so somebody needs to go out and get that money. Uh, the process of, people that, of actually catching the fish in this analogy is called obligation. When the FRA will commit to that party that they will fund that project. And another important step forward here is that the FRA now has the authority to do multi-year commitments, which they did not have in the past. 
Um, then you've got to get the thing constructed and done. And uh, this is an area because, you know, there's a clear process for construction at the highway level. Um, it's not quite as clear at the, feder at the railroad level. So you really need to keep up the pressure from us outsiders in order to make sure that process goes smoothly. And then we can enjoy the fruits of actually getting on those trains. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done, but it is the fun work because now we know that there's something that we can definitely get at the end of the tunnel. And the faster we are in persuading people to take advantage of this, the more likely is Congress is to continue appropriating funds. Um, so we're really in the exciting part of the pro process. What I hope people will prioritize right away is um, essentially two things at the same time. One is um, getting new trains running as soon as possible. Things that you can point to and say, this schedule is reduced because of this work. There are more departures because of this work, whether it's 10 trains a day to Milwaukee as opposed to today's seven, or if it's 10 trains a day to Milwaukee and three to Green Bay, which today has no service. We need to have a strong focus on getting more trains running as soon as possible. But concurrently, we also have to get states doing the big picture planning for those long-term projects. So in the case, again, in the Midwest, and I apologize to those that are out of the Midwest, it's, it's my home, so I know it the best, but you know, the hard part, the expensive part is gonna be Chicago. Um, and there hasn't been any real planning on how you get dedicated electrified tracks into Chicago. We need to start that planning right now while we're also figuring out how to add new trains to Cleveland, new trains to Detroit, you know, new trains from Atlanta to Charlotte while they continue to design their high-speed line, et cetera. So that's priority one, more daily departures. That means we need to get more trains under order. You know, when you're used to not getting anything but table scraps. It seems like Amtrak and has ordered a lot of trains, uh, but really when it comes down to it, they haven't. And even with the replacement trains that are on order, half of their fleet will be beyond what really should be in revenue service. And that doesn't really leave much room for expansion. And we've also had challenges because of the up and down nature of American railroads buying passenger trains. We don't have a good uh, supply chain here for passenger trains. So let's have the Federal Railroad Administration committing to buying more trains right away and doing it over time as opposed, opposed into fits and starts. So that's my priority number two, get the railroad uh, industry supply chain healthy and moving. And that requires spending money in that supply chain. Um, and then the third is we really need to get high, high impact projects underway. So getting a segment within five to 10 years where you can actually sit in a seat, buy a ticket for a train going 200 miles an hour should be a top priority someplace in this country. Um, getting the planning underway, as I said, for that first ring out of Chicago, um, their first ring out of, of Atlanta. Um, the Virginia project has some stuff that's ready to go. Also some stuff that they really need to amp up their planning work on. And of course, there's two, three, depending upon how you count them, high-speed rail projects underway in Texas um, and really get the planning work started in a real meaningful way for Portland, Seattle, Vancouver. Um, so three things at once that, that I think we need to do, but this is not going to be thinking about how we persuade the people at the top to do this. Our role is to help get more people at the ground level, at the municipal level, at the county level, pushing states and the feds to make this happen and greasing the wheel in the places that they can grease that wheel. 
So kind of in sum for this year, what I would like to see is a great uh, outcome is to have the Federal Railroad Administration just flooded with applications. So, you know, there's $66 billion in this first round. And I forgot to clarify, I going back to this slide here, I apologize for skipping this. So this is the amount that they're suggesting Congress should appropriate every year. This is the money we have to work to get every year in this column. So about $7 billion a year. This bill also had a one-time appropriation of $66 billion a year that um, the FRA has five years to obligate. Um, so um, that $66 billion is moving forward. Those are the applications that people can make uh, later this year. Um, hopefully, uh, applications for $120 billion come in, $200 billion come in. That will help make the case for this um, it, as we move forward. And it will also help to make the case for making those even bigger in the next reauthorization pro process. Um, so that's what I hope happens. And our role, and as I remember I said, our role in the fishing analogy is uh, to persuade mom and dad to go out and get some fish and, and to cook them and to help cook them. Um, so what we really need to do is get more friends into the party. Um, um, so there's more encouragement for people to go out and go fishing. Um, and that's, you know, you working with your local mayor, um, and we're working on one of the things we would like to have in place next year uh, that we're doing some fundraising for right now is a person who can spe who's specifically charged with helping people like you work with your mayor to help them get engaged in persuading the state to move forward um, and, and county leaders, et cetera. Um, so I wanna thank our members for helping the process. You've played a very, very, very important role in moving this process to this point. Um, we need to amp up our efforts now that the fun work begins. Um, so let's help get more people engaged. And, um, you know, uh, one is by, by being members um, and making extra donations. So if you would uh, like to help with that specific thing today, you can go to highspeedrail.us. And um, if you want to get some swag, hats, shirts, model trains, insulated mugs, um, that's the, the place you can go, highspeedrail.us slash swag. And uh, please send your friends there. So hopefully that's a good overview. And Chris, if you'll come back on, we'll see what questions we have. I think you're still on mute. Sure. Okay. There. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, uh, we have a lot of questions uh, here in in the chat and uh, or in the in the Q and A rather. Um, thank you to everyone who's asked questions. Um, I'm just going to start at the top. I've been sort of reviewing them uh, as, as Rick talked, but I'm just going to start at the top and hope that we can get to as many of these as possible. Um, uh, do you, the first one uh, comes from Steve. Um, do you expect the FRA to incorporate the existing regional plans into the national plan? Um, I, I want to, I will get to Steve's question in a second. Uh, but I see here a, a chat that I, I want to address very, very quickly here. Um, today, I've got the Midwest on my mind. I did mention that one of our top priorities should be to get people into seats of past 200 mile an hour trains as soon as possible. Um, and the best place to do that is in the Central Valley in California, because that project's already under construction. And as part of that, we actually um, led an advocacy campaign this past spring to help persuade the California legislature to release the remaining bond funds uh, from the 2000, 
uh, proposition, 2008 proposition. And they still have not released those funds. So we're gonna need to do some work there some more. So um, uh, uh, Greeny, if, if you would like to help us find more people in California to get engaged in that work, we very much want to amp up our work there. So thank you for pointing that out. Uh, but Steve, yes, I, I do think that the existing uh, regional plans are a key foundation that the FRA will use um, uh, to move forward. We'll be talking about the Midwest plan and how it actually relates to the Southeast plan in a couple of weeks. But I wanna point out that those plans are very high level. The states really have to seize the day uh, to put the meat on those bones. Um, and there's also a lot of the country that's missing from those plans. So there's a lot more work to be done there, but yes. Um, another Steve. So uh, we, uh, we also have a few, or we, we've talked a bit about California. Um, so uh, I'm gonna move on to a question from Peter um, regarding the zero dollars allocated at least so far for high-speed rail and the infrastructure bill. Uh, isn't the budget bill now moving to the Senate addressing that with an allocation of 10 billion dedicated to high-speed rail? And if so, do you know how that gets divided up? Um, so uh, yes, there is a $10 billion uh, line item as of today in the Re reconciliation bill. Um, and the only division in it is there is a certain uh, set aside for planning, which given the fact that so little planning has happened to date is, is a very important set aside, but it will be a competitive grant that um, um, any state or, or public entity can apply for. Thanks. And now uh, from Michael, um, when it comes uh, to regional rail projects, how important will it be for regional government agencies to have a matching fund source? Uh, will certain projects be entirely funded through this federal funding source or is it required that projects get matched by state and or local funding? Um, so historically, these projects have required a, um, a local match. And it's tended to be that having more skin in the game um, makes it, it uh, more attractive for the, for the entity that's, that's allocating the funds. So certainly a local match is super important and you definitely want your local state to have skin in the game. Um, it, this comes back to the governor um, and in each of these states, it plays a critical role in, in moving this forward. But also at the same time, it doesn't have to be the state that provides the match. So it could be a local, a local government entity or even a private entity in, um, in cases. Uh, so it's important to, uh, to have that match. And uh, speaking of the states, uh, here's a question um, from Bill Porter. Um, what role will the Illinois High-Speed Rail Commission have in steering this process in Illinois and in the Midwest? Um, so uh, the way our state boundaries are set up, uh, there are multiple states that depend upon Chicago. Um, and there's, there's more than you would think because if you're gonna have good service in Montana, uh, those trains need to go to Seattle and Chicago. Uh, so um, the Illinois High-Speed Rail Commission, it will be a forum for leaders across the state to um, have a discussion about how we create a much more aggressive plan to move forward in this state. Um, and um, it will, have to deal with the Chicago hub issue because you can't get high-speed trains into Chicago without um, a significant thinking about how all of the pieces work together. Um, so uh, it's a forum for leaders to talk and it's critical for the entire Midwest because Chicago is so critical to making service work to any other state in the Midwest. 
And, uh, and speaking again of the Midwest, here's another question um, from Daniel. Um, the, uh, the Lakeshore Corridor study you did suggested four trains between New York City and Chicago. Is this something we can advocate for? I want you to advocate for that. Um, so yes, and there's the uh, Lakeshore Alliance um, uh, has recently formed, led by the uh, All Aboard Erie. Uh, you can uh, learn a little bit more about that at lakeshoretrain.org. So I continue to believe that one of the best ways to add service quickly is to run trains all the way, especially on the Chicago to uh, New York corridor. That those, that's such an important, important travel market just on its own. And then each of the steps in between. Um, not a lot of people agree with me on that, but uh, because of the way people are constantly getting in off of that train, I think that's a great way to get the process started. Really focus on working with the Norfolk Southern and CSX for eliminating bottlenecks, both the freight and passenger is a way to add a couple of trains here and there. Um, so yes, please advocate for that. Uh, supply chain issues again. Uh, we, need to, we need to ramp up production of sleeper trains uh, for not just that, but others. But thank you for that good question. All right. Um... The uh, moving around a little bit here in the list uh, to give everyone a chance. Um, how much does the High Speed Rail Alliance believe will be needed annually for future projects, expansions, uh, maintenance, modernization? Uh, clearly, the budget will grow after a few years. Um, so, my goal is to really do this right on a national basis. I think we need to be thinking about all told. Um, and I'm com com uh, including commuter rail and um, uh, improvements to the freight network, you know, improvements that definitely uh, aren't, might not be passenger related, but improve the entire network. I think we should have a goal of $20 billion a year um, going into the railroad network. And um, again, that won't just benefit passengers. There's a lot of freight that needs service that looks a lot more, much le more like a passenger train uh, than a big heavy coal train. And so we should be investing in making the improvements that allow a lot more of that freight to move by railroad as well. And speaking of uh, you know where future money will come from and uh, money in the uh, you know range of billions of dollars, um, Ted asks a question: um, What billionaires might be interested in this capital investment? <laughs> if I wish I'd know, I still wouldn't. If I knew, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, um, let's be clear. For the most part. You know, you know the, the, the best way to make a small fortune in the airline business is to start with a really big fortune. Um, and that would be true in the, the railroad business as well. Um, so this really needs to be, until, until every road is a toll road, um, this needs to be a federal program um, with, with things happening on, private things happening on the fringes, just like in the airline business, the airports are publicly owned and then private entities uh, provide services on top of the foundation of publicly loaned airports. We have uh, uh, in the questions some detailed uh, questions about you know particular destinations, and here's one of them. Um, uh, will any of the projects include getting from Manassas, Virginia, to Charlotte, North Carolina? Um, so um, I want to make sure Manassas is on the existing line, right? Um, you know, my problem is I can't remember off the top of my head where Manassas is. But I will answer it a different way. Um, so you've got the Northeast Corridor that if you continue that on goes to Richmond um, and then on to Raleigh-Durham and then on to Charlotte. And so the state of Virginia, um, and we did a webinar on this about a year ago probably, 
um, recently purchased a uh, right-of-way in order to improve that dramatically. Uh, that gets you to the Commonwealth of Virginia's uh, border with North Carolina. And then North Carolina is in the process of negotiating with CSX to buy right-of-way uh, for another big portion of that. And then they own the right-of-way from Raleigh, Durham, Miranda, Charlotte. So yes, I imagine that that corridor will play a major role in this first round of funding. And uh, speaking of rounds of funding, um, Scott Rogers asks, um, has the first year appropriation for the annual authorization been committed yet for FY22 or is that still to come? Um, so, so the 2022 is, You know, that's a good question, but it's a confusing because we are in a continuing resolution now for 2022. So the, actually, as they debate the 2022 appropriation, which is happening now, that's the authorization. That's where that money would come from. And the authorization applies. The challenge there is it's looking very likely that there will be another continuing resolution for the rest of 2022. So I apologize for not quite knowing the minutiae of that, but there's a decent outline. And uh, this next question uh, is, uh, I think, about lessons learned from uh, you know one of the last times that we had uh, good prospects from the from Washington D.C. Um, Mark asks, "Are you concerned that a disproportionate amount of the 66 billion uh, could be spent on consultants doing repeated studies?" discrediting the entire rail program. We did not do so well with Obama's high-speed rail appropriation. Um, well, first of all, I want to clarify that given the Federal Railroad Administration was not a grant giving, a grant giving, uh, uh, grant managing organization for the most part until they suddenly had $10 billion um it's amazing how fast they got money out the door so we need to celebrate that we also need to celebrate the fact that the chicago to st louis corridor no longer has tracks in the bun and it no longer has trains that have to slow down to 10 miles an hour when it rains or any of the other problems that existed on that line in 2009 or to celebrate the fact that BNSF and worked to actually make improvements across Iowa with part of that money. The successes that occurred because of that money are very long. The problem was they weren't big dramatic successes. Um, but that's why we need to focus on getting municipal leaders state leaders focused on implementation and supporting the agencies as they run against hurdles that um, keep them from getting to implementation. Uh, so our role right now in supporting that process is very critical. And that's why we need to really step up our efforts. Yeah, the questions keep coming and I'm gonna, you know, I hope we can get to them all, but we still, we have 29 left. Um, so I'm trying to group them thematically a little bit here. Um, and, and this is sort of continuing, I guess, with um, the political side of things. Um, Fred asks, how insulated from political pressure would the FRA be when selecting the projects to be funded? Um, so um, I don't have a direct answer for that, um, but I wanna come back down to uh, frequently, the squeakiest wheel is the one that gets the, the grease. But what we want to have is squeaky wheels in 49 states. Um, so we should really be focused on getting local leaders to be asking for projects.
Great, and, uh, and speaking of local leaders, um, here's a local question. Um, while it might be obvious in your opinion, what are the most significant benefits municipalities would realize with having high-speed rail? Uh, specifically, what high-level talking points would you present to communities to convince them that high-speed rail is critical for our future? So the, the benefits come primarily for me in making cities healthier. So we made a huge mistake where we converted our downtown streets into highways um, in many cases, most downtowns. Um, you know, if, if you look in any small town, there's where the highway comes through um, in it, they, they split it into two one-way streets and they made a lot of dangerous things in that process. The second is we turned a lot of productive buildings into parking lots. Um, so we've made cities incredibly unhealthy, both for people and financially. By making it possible for people to visit cities on their feet, as opposed to in their car, now you can start to turn that parking lot back into productive land, and you can start to turn those highways back into safe and healthy streets. So this is a real catalyst for making our cities and towns, I wanna to be clear, towns as well, um, in a lot of towns, because if you've got high-speed rail running between um, Atlanta and New Orleans and stopping in Birmingham, and then you've got buses connecting at Birmingham to a lot of small towns, um, you've now made bus service possible for all those small towns that don't have bus service today. Uh, so this is the catalyst for making our cities healthy and productive and making our families healthier and productive. Um, and that's the primary reason I give. And in the process, even though we'll make travel easier and then we'll, more people will travel, we'll actually reduce carbon emissions and all kinds of other pollutions that go into our land and into our rivers, et cetera. I'm gonna try to group together a couple of questions about uh, the private sector here. Um, are there, first, uh, are there any US companies that make high-speed trains or parts? Um, and then uh, sort of related, uh, are existing railroad operators your allies uh, or not? So um, uh, there are existing companies that uh, build high-speed trains. So Alstom is building the new Acela trains um, in upstate New York. And uh, those trains right now, because they are going to be running on rough track in the Northeast corridor, the current design is limited to 186. Um, but if you were to have high speed, uh, true high speed tracks built in this country, you could put different trucks or in the rest of the world bogies under those and run them at most, much higher speeds. Uh, Siemens is in the process of building trains today um, that are good for uh, regional service and shared use. Um, and they could easily switch to building true high-speed trains. Uh, Stadler is building uh, good trains in Utah. Uh, Talgo has the ability to build trains as does Kawasaki. And I know I've missed one in there, so I apologize to you if I've missed you. Um, and then, you know, the, the supply chain has started up, uh, but we really need to amp it up in order to make sure that it's viable going into the future. So that was one. Uh, the other question is, um, and I will be very specific, the class one railroads, which are the biggest, Norfolk Southern, CSX, BNSF, CN, CP, Union Pacific, um, and for a little while longer, Kansas City Southern. Um, currently, they're not allies, but we need to change the deal. So instead of focusing on why they're getting in the way, let's focus on what it takes to get them to be advocates. So um, the case that comes up, and I saw a question about this, 
uh, the delay on New Orleans to Mobile in the discussion between CSX and the states and Amtrak over getting service to Mobile. Let's start with a different question. So what does it take to make it worth your while to do this? Um, and then I'll bet you it means that in order to afford it, you've got to run the trains faster and more frequently than what they're proposing in the first phase. It's going to take more money, but we're going to get a lot more value out of it. And I think because it's a critical thing that we need to really have a real policy discussion on. Um, today, we could do it simply by paying a little bit more, um, but it's something that we really should deal with in the next round of authorization. Rick, um, uh, I think this question uh, kind of invites you to elaborate on something that you mentioned in the in the, uh, the presentation about private railroads, but some of the question comes from Paul. Uh, will private company Brightline West working with state agencies in California and Nevada be able to get some funding in this first infrastructure bill? So um, I wanna be clear that in this case, I have the opportunity to be wrong, but it looks like they will. Um, and they've got a fantastic plan that's ready to go to construction. Um, so I'd like to see that happen as soon as possible. And um, uh, how should high-speed rail influence employment? Uh, so uh, in the first round, you know, this gives the opportunity for construction people uh, to move into building uh, uh, railroads the, the way that they build highways. Um, and then there's the operating jobs. But more importantly, the healthier communities are, the more economically productive they are. Um, and the more that we can make our local communities productive, uh, the more likely people are to locate factories there and other types of businesses. And so this is a key tool for making our economies healthier in general. And um, there's still so many questions. Um, uh, here's one um, back to the state level. Um, will, will state uh, departments of transportation take the lead in proposing projects to the FRA? Um, I want to apologize. I got slightly distracted. Can you ask me again? Sure, sure. Um, it's um, this question is about the the state level again. Will the and, and I guess it's a it's about the process. Um, will the state departments of transportation take the lead in proposing projects to the FRA? So uh, the states play the most important role in going for these projects. They don't have to be involved in every project but it's much easier if they are. Um, typically they have better capability of managing large sums of money. Um, and in many cases, the other entities that are capable of applying for these funds have participation by the state DOTs. Um, so like the you know, authorities that would apply for funds, probably there's a seat on, on the board of that authority that's controlled by the state DOT. So really the onus of this is falling on the states now. Great, thank you. And uh, uh, related to states, um, here's another question. In your opinion, what role may geographic equity play in the, uh, the US DOTs and the FRA's decision-making process? Um, that's not specifically uh, uh, laid out. But again, another piece of progress that I forgot to mention that gets towards the equity issue. One of the changes in policy is a new board for Amtrak. And typically the Amtrak board is, has been controlled by Northeast corridor interests. Um, now there's a specific division so that the whole country must be represented by that board. Um, so that's, again, a sense of the direction that Congress wants to go. Uh, 
Okay. Um, uh, here's a question about the, the Midwest again in Chicago. Um, in, in your opinion, what are the most important or critical municipalities to partner with in the Chicago land area to ensure high speed rail becomes a reality? Um, well, unfortunately, it's a, a, it's not that simple. So if you go out from Chicago, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 cities that specifically have service. Um, so all of them play a role in building a coalition. Uh, the city of Chicago certainly is, is super important. Um, Cook County is, is very important in this role. Um, Metra is a government uh, entity that's very, very important in, in, in this. Um, and then, you know, we need to really get Indianapolis, Detroit, Lansing, Grand Rapids, St. Louis, Madison, Milwaukee, Green Bay, and St. Paul and Minneapolis, um, and Louisville. We really need to get them much more involved because it's all tied together. The stuff that needs to happen in Chicago won't get done right if they don't know for sure that they're going to be running hourly service to St. Paul. And that won't happen if St. Paul and Detroit, et cetera, aren't saying that they want hourly service to Chicago. So a broad range of municipalities have a role to play. So no matter where you are, you need to be getting your mayor engaged. We still have so many questions, and I think we may only have time for you know maybe one one more, or maybe possibly a little more. But um, uh, are there any proposed or existing projects that utilize interstate highway corridors? Um, so uh, there can be. Um, I think um, as we look forward, uh, we need to really look at those rights of way and look at projects that are in the works that maybe you could add high-speed rail to it. Uh, the one that stands out in my mind the most, which is also kind of the most important of these projects in some ways, is Indiana is in the process of designing an interstate style upgrade to US 30 across Northern Indiana. And high-speed rail right-of-way should be included in that. There are other, other opportunities, but again, the states have not done a lot of planning work. So one of the things that needs to come out of this bill is real design work for answering these questions. We've had a, uh, a few questions about will a recording uh, of this be available? And yes, um, uh, if you go to HS, uh, HS uh, to, to our website, to the events page, uh, we have recordings of all these previous sessions there, and we'll we'll put them, uh, uh, you know, we'll put this one there within a few days. Um, and maybe the last question, unless Rick wants to take more, um, from Deborah: um, Will the FRA take input from Amtrak as they put together their prioritized list of projects? Um, yes, they will certainly take input as as they will from others. Um, so right now is the time to make sure that your community um, is heard. Um, yes, and then we can run late if you think that there are other questions that we should definitely answer. Well, um, we've got, we've still got uh, at least 25 here. So uh, <laughs> um, what if we do, uh, uh, well, let's do three more, uh, at least, you know, at least for now. Um, um, let's see. Uh, here's another um, a couple more geographic ones um, out to Colorado. Um, has anyone talked about making the proposed Amtrak line uh, for the front range of Colorado a high-speed rail line? Um, actually, uh, the Colorado DOT did commission a initial uh, initial design for high-speed rail on that corridor. Um, and one of the things that has changed as the planning process has gone forward over the last several years is it was always assumed that um, uh, uh, it was always assumed that high speed trains could not 
go onto shared use track and vice versa. The regulations have changed, so you can do some mixing. Certainly you can't have freight trains on high-speed track and high-speed trains can't go faster than 80 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour on, on shared use track. But train now the regulations are set so that the trains can go on both. And there's an opportunity to really make a difference in Colorado by thinking that way. Um, so I, I, would, I would hope that our California folks will start pushing for, you know, the Amtrak proposal is a first start. Let's get some trains running. But in terms of the longer, let's get figuring out how to do it bigger later. And uh, here's one um, about the allocation overall. Um, are there any allocation considerations being made by Amtrak on reducing fares, as I know that many people would ride if it were not so expensive? Um, so I don't know specifically. I agree with you, um, especially in the Northeast Corridor. It's my view that they should be running much bigger trains and, and charging much lower fares. Um, you know, if we're going to spend a lot of public money on infrastructure that needs to be available to everyone. So that's something that I would really like to see as this project moves forward. And here's a, another one about the economics uh, and demographics of, of rail, I guess. Are there any studies that can highlight a correlation between high-speed rail funding and poverty rates? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any. Okay. And um, we've had a lot of interest uh, in the in the Q and A and in the chat in California. And uh, Rick, I wondered if you you know just wanted to you know uh, say anything about uh, you know the the importance that you see for the the work that's underway in California right now. So uh, California is critical to moving this forward politically, um, and we need to have a lot of focus on getting an operating segment in operation as soon as possible. Um, it's, if you don't understand how robust the California passenger train network already is, um, and their network is far beyond any other states outside the Northeast Corridor. If you don't understand how robust that network is today and how much bigger it's going to be in the next or better it's going to be in the next several years. It's hard to understand. And if you also don't understand how big Bakersfield, Fresno and Merced are, it's hard for people to understand if you look at a flat map, why it makes sense to start Merced to Bakersfield. But given the fact that it's already under construction, that's the best place to get high-speed trains running in this country in the near term. Let's get that done. And it's going to take a lot more persuasion in Sacramento to make that happen. So we really need, uh, we need to build a stronger effort in California to push, push that across the uh, finish line. All right. Um, on that note, I thought I should check in. Um, do you, uh, Rick, what do you think? Should we, uh, do you wanna take a few more or, uh, or wrap up? Um, well, I want to point out, I, I did see that uh, Bonnie uh, put in a comment that she wants daily service on the Cardinal. Um, my view is yes, but it should be twice daily if you're going to go out all that at trouble. At least have a train stopping in every city um, during daylight hours. Um, and is there anything else that's a big topic that we haven't answered? Um, um, here, here's one about electrification, since that's important. Um, the Northeast Corridor electrified the line from New Haven to Boston in the 1990s. Should that be a model for further expansion of electric service? Absolutely. We should be much more aggressive about electrifying. Um, in, and it's, it's not cheap, but highways aren't cheap either. And we're going to get a lot more value out of electrifying the railroad network. Um, if we focus on that. Um, so absolutely, that should be a focus. Okay. Um, we've, uh, we've also had a, a couple of questions about um, being able to copy the chat and Q&A. I think we can do that. Um, 
Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see if we can somehow make that available. But again, the the recording of of the uh, of the session will be available within a within a few days. Excellent. And remember, tell your friends highspeedrail.us slash swag, and they too can have a hat or a face mask. But seriously, you know, we are in a critical time. The more people who are involved, uh, the more likely success will come. Um, and the more uh, that you are involved, the more we can get mayors involved. So thank you to those on the call who are a member. Uh, we really appreciate your role in this. You have a very important role to play and um, let's have others get involved. Um, so thank you again for attending. As always, our phone is open. You can get the phone number at highspeedrail.us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Join us in two weeks for a discussion about the state rail plans. Thank you.